back to the start end, the Astro Sculpture Group. Um, obviously, there's been plenty of Astro Sculpture going on anyway over the last uh, month, certainly. Yeah. Um, as you see, we've got a bike of recent posting for the last month or so from the uh, Society Astro Sculpture Group Facebook page, if you're not a member of that. Um, go to the Astronomy Society Facebook page and join because there's loads of people post what they're doing and most everyone's always quick to help when people have issues and things like that so it's uh, definitely worthwhile um yeah there's some really nice stuff been being done there's some <laughs> some great seat changes and we've got a couple of people i think are some new contributors as well um uh, be nervous to say how they're doing good up there <laughs> up in the hospital and such um so really nice stuff a lot more detail there in the new podcast um so yeah there's uh there's been quite a lot going on, I guess you can see the news for the last few minutes. Um, yeah, so um, what I was going to do this evening is try and be talk about in slightly more detail aspects of planet imaging. Obviously not very long ago I did a talk on a sort of run through of how to do planet imaging for a museum. Um, so I want to just look at a couple of the bits we skimmed over. Uh, and if anyone, and really if people have been trying to do planet imaging, which obviously a few people have, and they're having any issues or there's any um, challenges or particular areas that they need to get some hints and tips on, then you know, please do that because that's what this is really for. Okay, so let me get out of the slideshow. Okay, you've lost the mouse again. Okay, so we don't really have a, what you call a presentation here as such. Um, it's more a case of I've got a, a spreadsheet with a few things in it to talk about. So, um, so before talking about these items here, which is really some examples of some specifics of how I go about that sort of thing, um, I want to talk about a couple of areas. The first one, which uh, I think everybody struggles with, is focusing. Focusing for planet imaging is, is hard. In fact, it's harder than focusing for detail imaging. No question at all. Detail imaging, very simple. You say, here's a star, uh, you use some kind of library or some kind of uh, repeater scanner thing, you run it against a curve and you get a full width height matching number going down and you set the load height. That's really the heart and soul of focusing for detail imaging. You can't really be wrong because the load number is the load number. Uh, or you use a bad enough map or something where you just go and pull, pull the lines up and you're out. The challenge is keeping the focus over time though, is the potential complication. Planetary imaging, all of that's really a bit useless. <laughs> there's no dot, there's a disk half the size of your textbook area. There's, uh, there's nothing to run a bad enough map on really because there's no single point. People try it and they do use it, but it's, it's difficult and couple hours not to do. So when you come to capturing, to focusing a planet, what are the, the key tips that I use? The first thing is get approximate your focus on a star. Go to a bright star in the sky and get yourself approximately focused. It's quite easy to do. Um, it's easy to line up on Sirius or on Canopus through your finder scope. Then get your camera and set up your planetary imaging. It'll show that star because it's so bright and get to the point where it looks like a point of light. You're not trying to get precise focus, but approximate. That means you can then find your planet very easily. Because if you're well out of focus, a diffuse disk like a planet will just not show up at all. Mm -hmm. Unlike a star, which will show up as a donut, it's quite often in the planet that you find they just don't show up at all. So you then track back to where your planet is, center it using your finder scope, which you previously aligned to your telescope, as we discussed previously. In previous meetings, super key part, get your finder scope properly aligned, center on your finder scope, and fire your camera up and fire your camera up with the full frame in view and the exposure turned up a bit. So basically, you're overblowing it. Uh, the frame rate's not going to be great at that point. Um, you find if you turn up the exposure and you're in a full frame, you're not going to be getting 100 frames a second. <laughs> but you might, it doesn't matter if you're in 10, it's fine. You should have your planet in view at that point. If you don't, you can use the finding facility. Uh, if you're using a 
um, you might issue them off with a star up there or something like that, with a spiral button, that sort of doing sort of thing, until you sit. And you sit, just flash across the screen. Um, if you're just outside, it's actually, it's actually quite easy. If you've got your time to line, getting the camera in view. Once you've got a planet on the screen, you're halfway there. Sorry, I'm not hearing any of this. <laughs> oh well, it's not that deep. Um, okay, so we've got a planet somewhere in view. We then turn down the speed on your buttons on your telescope mount to one or two, rather than what you've been using to track around the sky and find things, and then bring it to the centre of the frame. What you're then going to do is you're going to change your capture area. I mean, I'll park, I should probably, maybe I should park the uh, shark cap anyway, um, so I'm not actually just talking in a vacuum here. Um, okay. um, I did actually bring, I did actually bring a camera. Talk a bit about different cameras. Um, this camera belongs to the Society. Uh, it's a USB 3 um, fairly high quality planetary camera from Spiritual Life, probably the best planetary camera. Oh, that actually belongs to the Stardome. This one's the Stardome one, is it? Sorry, yeah. the other one's the cap. The, yeah. the, but this is supposed to be the best one for capture, so mm. the idea is to use this with the Zeiss. We're going to be using this with Zeiss to do some capturing. So people who are interested in possibly getting involved in that should you know, have a chat because we definitely want to get that going, Agile. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be obviously very keen to get that going. Zeiss is a good instrument to connect. A superb instrument. It's kind of what it was originally more than things it was originally built for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it pairs extremely well with some of these cameras. So, yeah, I think we're uh, it's definitely something we need to get. So, we're in... Up uh, we're not seeing even a grey screen at the moment, but um, sorry, I'm trying to do things on the one screen here, it's rather difficult. Although the XP is set to, no, it's pretty high. Ah, it's going to be steady. So, here we are. We're on full screen. We've got a uh, overexposed a little bit, uh, and we're looking at 35 frames a second, so that's fine. The first thing you do is you've got a you know, come in and you've got you've got a dot, not particularly well focused, over quite a big white dot in the middle. You brought it to the center, that's too good. You're then going to go to your back to your controls and you're going to go, okay, let's zoom in a little bit on that. I don't literally zoom in. Um, what, what am I on? Down yeah, eight hundred by six hundred somewhere. Nine six two. Okay, down down a couple. Sorry, I'm at just the wrong angle to look at the screen. Um, okay, there we go. So this is, you can see over the right hand side here, you can see this, the black box shows you which part of your frame you're capturing. So you're capturing the middle and that's the middle. So this Jupiter thing would be half that capture area, most likely if you're using a, something like a uh, C8 or you know, something of that nature, with the bar light. Yeah, half capture, area, great big disc, yeah. easy to focus. Now, the fundamental question, thing about focusing is, if you haven't got some kind of electric focuser, you're going to have a timer <laughs> of it. If you're reaching over and focusing the knobs on the telescope, you're going to have a hard time. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but you're going to have a hard time. First thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to have the screen arranged so that you can see it from the telescope when you're standing next to it, so it's quite closed and pointing at you. Secondly, you have to be incredibly careful touching that focus knob, <laughs> not to move the telescope. You're going to see the planet's going to wobble while you're focusing it. But it doesn't matter the first two or three years I was doing planetary imaging, I didn't have an electric focuser, so I was just managing with the knob on the C8. So what we do is, first thing is, bring it in reasonably close to focus with it over bright, then we start playing with our settings. Uh, I'll talk about the kind of settings you can use. You want to get to the settings very similar to what you're going to use for capture. <coughs> so you should have a little chart for your telescope and camera. That's going to go, okay, well on Jupiter, a starting point might be, might be 20 milliseconds is actually quite good. And bring the gain way down to a, whatever reason. The, those numbers are so dependent on your camera that for different cameras, gain means something entirely different. My old QHY camera, I'd be working at a gain of eight. On this camera, I'm working at a gain of 300 <laughs> for the same effect. So the numbers mean what the manufacturer means by them. So 
all you can do is play around. If you're looking for as low a gain as you can get away with without sending your exposure time too high, you don't really want exposure times much over 20 for Jupiter, because at 20 milliseconds, you can get 50 frames a second, because that's how many 20 milliseconds fit in, 50, in one second. You can never get more than that. Anyone getting more than 50 frames milliseconds at 20 millisecond exposure, this 50 frames a second is not, in fact, getting that, because you can't. Um, so you get it to that kind of setting, and you're going to see a disc quite clear. You're going to see color. You're going to probably see some, some hint of patterns on it. Um, we can then start to focus. What you do focusing, effectively, you're rocking your focus backwards and forwards across the focus point, getting closer and closer. And if you're using an electric focuser that shows a number, most of them will show some kind of num number indicating where you are in the focus. Make a note of where it looks good. Then bring it out a little bit, bring it back in. You're basically rocking back and forwards, trying to find the perfect point. Um, people frequently try and focus on the moons, if Jupiter, if they're having trouble. So if there's a moon, some moons very visible close to it, you can turn the exposure up a bit, try and get one of the moons as crisp as you can. And in theory, that should mean the planet can focus as well because they're all the same distance away. Um, the, if you can manage to get your focus established while the red spot or one of the more prominent features is in the front, or there's it even better that there's a shadow <laughs> from a moon transiting, then you're, that's really easy, especially if there's a shadow from a moon transit, because trying to focus that little tiny black dot on Jupiter is extremely easy. Trying to focus when you're looking at the back of Jupiter and it's all just subtle cloud patterns is a lot harder. It's all about practice and patience. You will spend, you can spend 10 minutes getting your focus right before you start capturing. And 10 minutes isn't very long when you're going to settle down for two hours to admit. And it's worth it. The quality of your images, if you just spend the extra 10 minutes focusing, is night and day over what you'll get otherwise. So if you don't think you've got the focus right, you kind of don't waste your time capturing videos because the one thing you can never fix is out of focus. I know there's some very clever technology out there that possibly can, but generally, if it's out of focus, it's, it goes in the bin. So. <laughs> Um, it the same anyway. Yeah. The same. So, so you can find this focus point and see, you'll see what's on, on the screen. So if I've done this, let me, no, I'll just disconnect that camera because it's not really doing anything like right now. Um, that's the easiest bit of chunk, I think. Come on. No? Okay. Right. So um, if I go back to my folder here, This is a capture. This was not a great night's capturing. This is fairly recent. Um, this is in focus fairly well. Uh, obviously, it's, it's too big. Now, you're seeing the black and white gridding on it. That's because I've captured it in RAW, uh, which is a more efficient way of capturing the video, but it doesn't debay the color matrix on the camera. So you see it all spread out as a grid. Um, this is not. This is a. This is what I would say is bad focus. So it's, it's usable, but not great. You can see the cloud patterns, even on the video, you can see the cloud patterns, you can see some more shape. So the red spot around here, you can definitely notice you have a red spot well. They actually, this actually looked a, looked a lot better when you were seeing it in color, much smaller when you were capturing it. So it's, uh, I'm gonna make that a bit smaller, essentially, because it's kind of misleading. And I'll load it into Reggie, into uh, Autostack there so you can see. So, yeah, that's a bit more useful, isn't it? That's a little bit more like what you did. That, that's, you're getting there with your focus when you see that kind of thing live. Um, that if you can't, if it doesn't look that good on your screen, then you know, work, you need to improve it rather <coughs> than uh, go ahead and capture stuff a little. That's a baseline for the quality. If, um, if there's some nights the seeing is really bad, this is jumping about like this all over the place. I mean, it did jump about a little bit there, but it's jumping about all over the place, coming in and out of focus because the sky's up. Sometimes you realize the scene is not there and all you're doing is going to make some crappy pictures. Now, if you're just setting up in its first few times, go for it anyway because at least you get some pictures. But um, you know, that, that's kind of a baseline to get a, get a reasonable picture out. Sean, if yes. you use a um, uh, electronic focuser yep. and you take a note of the, of the number that it's sitting at, can you come back? Can you 
use it again. Right. Yes. If your equipment is in the, if you, not for the final focus, you still need to focus, but for getting right. it close. Yeah. If you, if your equipment is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Repeatable. <laughs> what it means is you're not changing anything. Mm. One of the major things that change that you, people change that changes is this thing here. If you're all familiar with one of these, I assume, or most of you, that's a standard planetary camera. So this is the camera. These, these ones have got a slightly bigger back end than the older ones because they're cool, they're a little bit chunkier on the side, a bit more heat dissipation going on. Um, this is just put on the end and it's just an extension tube and then it's a, this goes into the focuser. Problem is, of course, you take that out, you do other things, you come back ready for your image and you put it in. Really important, if you're going to do repeatable stuff, is the rings that come with the camera usually, you get them on there, you get that set for the depth you want it in, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. You get that locked on and you don't touch it. As long as you don't touch that, you put that camera back in there, it's going to be in the same place. So in theory, if you don't mess with the equipment too much and nothing major changes, then you're going to be within an ace of right. still in focus. If you're still going to have to manually focus right. the last bit because the temperature and the altitude in the sky changes. Um, it changes throughout the night. Now, as a focusing for planets, you, if it's a good night, you might get an hour before you really have to refocus. You're not going to get more than that, I don't think, from my experience. Every, every half an hour, maybe to an hour, depending on how the night's looking, you need to go in and tweak the focus again. It's well, once you've got the camera settled down and cooled and it's taking images and it's actually quite easy to make minor adjustments to the focus, especially if you've got something that's giving you a focus number because you know where you've gone away from it and back to it. Um, so some kind of electronic focuser is, is just a huge boon. In fact, I would say it's essential for planetary imaging if you want to produce images without spending half your life mucking around with focus and never really being happy with the result. Uh, it's almost a given. And they're not expensive to get some kind of electronic focus. It doesn't need to be a temperature compensating, you know, fancy thing for deep sky stuff if that's not what you're doing. You can get away with a really quite cheap basic focus stuff. But it means that you're not touching the telescope and you can repeatedly move things. Uh, you can get a proper focuser in line that's, you know, program that does the everything temperature compensating and everything else. That's just as useful for this, of course. But they can cost you as much as your telescope if you're not careful. <laughs> so, okay, so we've got it. <laughs> we've got it focused, uh, we've got it um, fired up and seen it. So, what kind of settings? Oh, sorry, okay, before we go into settings and stuff, talk about the depth of this sitting inside your presumably barlow. Most of the time, you're doing planetary imaging, you're going to be using a barlow because what you want is magnification. You want the image on this chip to be as big as possible. And there's a lot of people out there, a lot of talk out there about. Mathematically ideal chip sizes, ideal pixel sizes for the center. They don't really apply to planetary imaging because you're taking videos, you're stacking thousands of frames of video. What you want is just the most pixels you can possibly get on the screen without reaching the point you can't get a focus properly. Generally, you want to try and you really do want to push your limits a bit on getting a big image. I found the bigger image you can get on the chip the better you're going to find images are going to turn out to be because the more you've got to work with. So that's, um, that's okay. Now Barlow's have a, theoretically when you get a Barlow lens, you're all familiar with Barlow lens? Mm -hmm. Right. You get a Barlow lens that says two times on it. It doesn't tell you the focal length of the Barlow lens. <laughs> Why it doesn't tell you that on the Barlow lens, I have no idea. In theory, if you're going to have, to, in order to be two times, the chip on the camera, the actual you know, imaging point, should be the focal length of the barlow away from the lens on the bar, from the middle of the barlow optics. Uh, I don't know why they don't mark it on the barlows, I don't know, they just don't. It's something you can work out, and it's possibly worth an exercise that's worth thinking about with your equipment. So if I go to, I've got to this one here, I've got a link which I'll post this. Barlow calculation. This guy here, some of you may have been astrophotography FR without realizing it. He's a guy, Thierry something, French guy, who posts, he's been doing, posting tons of stuff about astronomy for, for a decade or more. And a lot of the time when you go Google for something, he's actually one of the prominent sources of information. He's very informative. This page on his one, Focal, will tell you how that works and tell you how you can work out what magnification you're actually getting out of your barlow. Because 
if you just shove that in the barlow, you can damn sure you're not getting two times. You could be getting one and a half times, you could be getting two and a half times. You can adjust the magnification of your barlow by adjusting how deep the camera sits inside the barlow lens. Generally, if you bring it outwards, you increase the magnification. So if you bring it out, if it's supposed to be 100 mil and you put it at 150 mil, then you get substantially more magnification than you would, you get two and a half times instead of two times. That's actually worth experimenting with for planetary imaging. You don't have to use the barlow at its focal length. There's no, no quality loss from going away from that focal length. There's a general principle that the higher the magnification, the more challenging the focusing gets because you're, just because you're pushing the optics of your telescope further. And the worse collimation issues can become, you amplify everything. But definitely you can push it. You certainly don't want to be underutilizing the bio. So you don't want to be pushing it in too far. So it's worth making the effort with your bio. You can calculate your scale, your magnification, by looking at how big the image is in pixels, and working out how big the pixels on your camera are and doing the maths. And that's actually also explained on that page how you do that. If you're into it and you really want to get the best images, I suggest that page is worth a go and see about doing the calculation for your own equipment. Uh, I'm generally pushing mine a little bit. I like to say I try and get as much magnification as I can because I, I like big images to play with. You can always shrink it down afterwards, um, which always increases the quality, of course. If you, can, if you can reduce your out, once you've done all your processing, if you can shrink the image by 50% and then save it, it gets crisper, it gets cleaner, it looks better. So, what do we do? Right, so that was just a quick like, thought about barlow lenses and how to make use of them effectively. Um, what kind of capture settings? You've got three primary planets for imaging, which is obviously Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. There's also Venus, there's also Mercury, and there's also the outer gas giants are perfectly imageable this way. But some of the same rules don't really apply unless you've got some serious equipment. Uh, and infrared filters and some really good cameras, then you're not going to catch in detail on you know, Uranus and Neptune. That said, you can, in fact, if you've got a 14-inch telescope and a you know, good camera and the, the appropriate filters, and you know what you're doing, you can get cloud detail on some of the gas giants, the outer gas giants, but mostly you're just taking a little blue disc, but at least you can make it a focused little blue disc. <laughs> And it's quite exciting actually seeing your first image of Neptune that you've taken, even if it's just a, a slightly magnified blue dot. You know, the fact is you took a picture of Neptune from your back garden, that's really quite something. Yeah. The same, Pluto is only going to be a pixel, but it's Pluto. <laughs> so, you know, you, the same, all this stuff does apply to those, but, you know, you're not going to get that much detail. So, if you look at the relative brightness of these objects, currently, I've got a magnitude there, it's right now, the magnitude for Jupiter is obviously the brightest by a substantial margin of uh, minus 2.65 um, magnitude which is makes it as bright as some of the very bright stars I'm not even sure how it, make, well, it makes it very bright indeed I need to see it in the night sky how bright it is Saturn is a lot fainter than Jupiter um, and Mars is brighter than Saturn but nowhere near as bright as Jupiter however Mars is in some ways brighter <laughs> Mars is smaller so it's, the brightness is across a much smaller area. And it's also got a much sharper um, contrast. So the Mars actually appears much brighter on your camera than it theoretically the object is. Because this magnitude here is how bright the total light coming from the object is. Well, Mars being, if Mars was a third of the bright disk of Jupiter, that's nine times smaller, so it's nine times brighter. So it's actually, you know, it comes across a lot brighter than you would think. Mars is much easier to image in some ways than the others because it's so easy to focus, because it's very sharp. Relatively for these objects, um, I've got maximum imaging times here. That's how long I tend to assume you can safely image that planet before you're going to have the rotation of the planet causing smearing on your image. If you image Jupiter too long in one video, all you're gonna see is everything smeared around the disk. Some people out there, you read Damien Peach's, Damien Peach has got some really good uh, articles on about his um, imaging, and there's a few other people out there who are really good. Um, they, some people go, they just won't do more than a minute on Jupiter without doing some kind of derotation or something, because it does move. And if you take a, two images a minute apart, flip between them, you can see the movement. So yeah, it's a compromise, it rotates, you want a sharp image, but you need a decent number of frames in order to be able to get a low noise quality image out. 
two minutes is a good compromise, I think, for Jupiter on a standard setup. Mars, you can go a lot longer. Mars rotates three times slower than Jupiter, approximately. Yeah, Any something in that A little bit less than three times, isn't it? It's three hours for Jupiter. 24 for. Nine hours. Yeah. Nine hours for Jupiter. Nine. Yeah. yeah. So it's two and a half times, something like that. So you can, amazingly enough, go two times further with the amount of time you're recording it. It's also smaller, so the surface is moving at a slower speed than Jupiter, moves with less distance. So you can probably go even further than 240 seconds. 240 seconds is nice, that's going to be a lot of frames. Um, Saturn sits somewhere in between. Uh, one of the reasons Saturn sits in between is even though it rotates fast, faster than Jupiter, approximately the same. It's, slow, I can't it's about the same, it's in the same general area, uh, but it's slightly smaller and there really isn't very much surface detail on Saturn in terms of rotational detail. If you took a picture of Saturn three minutes apart, you would not visually be able to discern the difference between those two images. Most of the detail on, on Saturn is just across the banding. You have the hex on top that everybody would imagine they're seeing in their images. <laughs> Mostly they imagine they're seeing in their images unless they've got some serious kit, but um, yeah. Uh, you know, in general, Saturn can push you a bit further. In contrast with that, Jupiter, you can take shorter frames, generally. Uh, so you can take maybe, I, when I did those captions there, that's 18 milliseconds for the exposure on Jupiter, which means you get um, 55 frame rates on it. So you've got 55 frame rate, 120 seconds, 6,666 frames of, in a video from Jupiter each time. If you're using a USB 3 camera <coughs> onto an SSD, which you probably should be, you will get that many frames on your disk. Uh, Saturn, again, longer exposure, but longer, ex longer exposure and longer image time gives you about the same number of total frames. Mars, I've actually written 24 there for the exposure, but I'll be honest, I didn't actually have a sample from the same day or anything like that. You can almost certainly shorten your exposure on Mars substantially and get a lot more frames, but because it's longer, you could be easily looking at 15,000 frames from a Mars video. Um, that makes a big difference in terms of what you can get out of your stack at the other end. So there's some, some sort of, that's for, for a particular camera, that's for this camera on my telescope, that's kind of where I want. Um, as far as deciding what exposure to have, um, we can go back to Sharp Cap again. Um, I think you probably have seen this. Some of you may have seen this when I did the talk before, but uh, some of you may not, so just having a look at that. <laughs> versions on this machine. Okay. We bring Sharp Cap back over and we connect it. Right. And we then go to this little button here. Right. And we'll turn up the No, light pollution is of no significance at all. Um, I'll talk a little bit about filters at the end of this, given you brought it up. It's, it's an interesting topic because these cameras have an infrared filter, usually. You need to make sure you know whether your planet camera's got an infrared filter. If it hasn't, you might well need to use one because infrared throws everything off into the blue. It creates light that doesn't refract at the same, refract substantially differently than the red and green, certainly. So you can end up with a blue, blue purple fringing. You may have seen images with a purple fringe to things. Usually that's because the camera is sensitive to infrared and it represents infrared as blue and purple, but it's not refracted quite the same as the other wavelengths of light. So because it's, it's further out on the spectrum, so it ends up being in a slightly different place on the camera, which is why you end up with a fringe. So you use an infrared filter, uh, infrared blocking filter, and you then don't have a fringe anymore. So that's an issue. The other alternative is you can use an infrared filter, so you only get the infrared light, which actually gives you much sharper information about some details. Some people will take infrared images of planets and they see details that you can't see any other way because the infrared's in some ways better. It doesn't get, dis it doesn't get affected by the atmosphere nearly as much. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. So 
Okay, so the, the, the histogram while you're capturing, this is, should be up all the time while you're capturing. Um, you ignore the big white one. You're looking at the three colors. Well, white stuff in the green here, you know, is what you're pointing out in this room. None of the, none of the, work this, where these hit the bottoms, none of those should be over maybe 60% for capturing. Keep your exposure down, exposure time down to the point where you're into maybe 60% on the red usually when you're capturing a planet because they are mostly tinted towards the red. Um, if any of those are going up towards the top, it's, it's tempting to look at the white one and go, oh, that's at 60%, but then the red's probably off the scale. And once something's off the scale, it's blown out in the image, you can't recover. You can't, which is what, this is, the worst problem is with moon captures because you invariably see people's moon captures and all the highlights are white and kind of going boom as if there's a like, as if there's a reflective thing on the tips of all the craters where there's a big white blue. That's because they were trying to expose the whole image and not looking at the fact that they were blowing out the highlights. You never want to put the blow out the highlights. Always underexposure rather than overexposed. Noise comes from underexposure. Well, we're dealing with noise by having thousands of frames. So don't definitely always underexpose and overexpose. If you overexpose, your image is gone. Obviously, if you overexpose enormously, you're not going to have that much detail. There's going to be lots of noise. So aiming, you're aiming to keep everything inside 60-ish is where I found best results. And I know Liam agrees with me, and that seems to be a pretty much consensus. Um, our best images come from that. You need the peak of the red can be about 50, just short of 50%. Um, so you do that. Both. <laughs> you gain what you're compromising a little bit. Um, you want to try and get the exposure down as, as much as you can, because mm -hmm. the exposure being as short as possible means that you're when things are wobbling about, you're capturing an instant in time, so it's shorter. You're also getting more frames per second the lower. The, but you took gain to compensate for that, and you introduce noise. So you have to find for your camera, you have to find the balance point at which it's, uh, there's not too much noise, but you can get your gain down. You don't want to be imaging with your exposure substantially higher than 20 milliseconds if you can help it, because you just don't get enough frames. You really want, don't want less than 5,000 frames in the stack. You know, that's, that's the kind of starting point. So if you can get, if you can, if you, you can get images with less, but you know, if you want nice images. So to me, um, I have to say when, um, Mars was opposition a couple of years ago, you know, we had the big Mars opposition thing. I was able to image at, if I remember, about 8 milliseconds, which is, a, so that's a lot, of, that's 120 frames a second. That uh, makes a hell of a difference when you're taking 240 second frames, 120 frames a second. That's a lot of frames to play with later. And the images that come out there and reflect that. Uh, they're amazing. So, yep, we do all that so that we then hit capture. Um, obviously you know, you probably know if you've got these tools already that you can say what, you can specify the planet name where it says target name and it'll save the files under that name. When you say start capture, you get an option to say how long you want the capture to be, etc. What I said about RAW rate, over here you've got color space. There's a few options. RGB24 is like normal video that you can watch using a video player. Um, but it's, it's slower to save and it's, which means you can get more lost frames when you're saving and capturing a video and it takes up a lot more disk space and it's just nasty. So I generally choose raw 8 which means that each of the channels is just stored as an 8-bit stream from all the four, all three color chips. There's actually four, of course there's two greens <laughs> um, on a chip because that's how the matrix works. Um, so that just, that just putrid out the disk as it is. And your um, auto stacker or Registax is perfectly capable of understanding that kind of thing of video. So I'll go back to that if you haven't got an ASCOM facility or whatever, but it does mean it's going to run out of frame. <laughs> At some point, it also means that you're moving out of this exact center of your frame and you're risking your collimation issues coming into play. As you know, collimation usually means the middle of the frame is the best, the edges are less good. So it can drift over the edge and you can lose quality on your shot. I'd like to keep the image dead center in my frame if I possibly can because that's consistent. Every, ideally, you want everything across all your captures to be exactly the same bit of equipment, like the middle part of your telescope. Okay. 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 Right, yeah, that's another point. Actually, Keith's bringing the big points today. Well, <laughs> polar alignment. 
No, no, it's gr the good points that I should be mentioning. Mm. Polar alignment. We are here to say, what can you do to improve your images? You can polar align your telescope properly. A lot of people think, and I thought initially when I was starting this stuff, if you don't plan for it, it doesn't really matter about polar alignment. It's not like you're trying to take a five minute exposure curve and send it on one pixel. You know, you can move your capture there. Not really true. If your telescope is really well polar aligned, then it will, you don't need to be running things to keep it centered because it will center itself, it will stay in the center for hours. When I've had the polar alignment nailed, I can spend a couple of hours and not have to move the telescope. You know, it's perfectly centered. And it's, it's jiggling less, everything's better. So absolutely, if you can get your mount permanently mounted and get the polar alignment sorted out, you're gonna take a lot easier images. You're also gonna come in another night, go Jupiter, and it's gonna box center every time. And believe me, that's <laughs> a wonderful thing and saves you so much pulling your hair. When you get those nights when you set the telescope up and you can't get the damn thing in the frame at all, you've all been there and it's just, you give up in the end and go to bed. It's so frustrating. So <laughs> anyone who hasn't had a night like that is kind of nice. But, um, so, okay, so we can go back to our, um, I'll go over here, sorry. Why don't you change this? So um, there's definitely some oddities with the colour, as you can see, it's still coming out looking a little green. Doesn't really matter, it all sorts itself out in the wash, but um, uh, yeah. right. Okay, so we've loaded our image and torture stacker, it's debated the image properly now. So cool. um, <coughs> I'm not gonna run through a how to use auto stacker thing because we've done that before. And if anyone if anyone has no idea how to use these programs, we can arrange to show again or whatever. So we're going to talk stack it. One of the points I, a couple of points I like to talk about, one is AV grids. And this image is a crappy, so it's not really relevant. Sometimes you get, you get being really good Jupiter images, but you find that the area around the poles, you don't really get great detail on. Um, you know, you get this really great detail up in the middle. So the poles are a little bit less good. One other thing i found is a really nice tip, in the, the auto-stacker, due to the automatic placement of the thing, then you can click on each of these to remove them. Remove all the ones in a line across the poles, increase the size and use bigger alignment points around the poles, and it deals better with the, because uh, the the, there's less contrast in the area, the very small alignment points don't deal well with the lack of contrast. So generally, rather than the whole image being done with big alignment points in order to do that, you can use smaller alignment points across the high detail areas and larger ones across the low contrast areas and it actually works fine, it does a really great job. Okay, so we stack these. Um, we do the usual analyzer, we usually just analyze and stack, we don't really have to mess about. Um, you can use the size and width to center the frame and so you don't stack a little black space if you capture the much more image. You can see I've got two frame centers listed there. The reason I've done that is, I've seen a few images people have been doing, and so I've seen people posting 5%, here's a stack of 5% of my images. And I, my experience has been that even if your graph doesn't really look that marvelous, 5% is unnecessarily long. So this, this is not a great, pic, great, a great video. Um, let it do its stacking, you'll see the little graph you get that shows the relative quality of the images. Um, <coughs> well, you can see it doesn't really like it. That green line is not impressive. Generally, you'd hope for this green line to come up here somewhere and get more like halfway before it takes a dip below the middle line. So I'm just going, eh, it's not great. 
Maybe I'd be tempted to say I'm only going to use 5% of those frames. And I've done that. I've ca captured, I've stacked this using 5 and 25. So I've got two output images. I then, um, which you can do, that's easy enough. Um, and there on this machine. I've then loaded those into RegiStacks, which I assume you're all familiar with RegiStacks for doing wavelets. And I've done the same, exact same process in RegiStacks on these two images. Um, one of them was this one, which. Um, that's a 5% stack. It's not bad, but it's a bit noisy. Um, that's a 25% stack. It's like, I mean, I, if I flip back and forth between them, I mean, it's just not. I mean, to me, the 25% stack is enormously better than the 5% stack. The only difference is I chose to stack 25% frames. Looking at the graph, I probably wouldn't have done 25%, but as it turns out, it's a much better image. And you still, and that, I haven't even spent time in Registax trying to take advantage of that low noise. You get, the more images you use, the less noise you get. The longer, you'll reach a point with those images where you go over 50% and you suddenly find you're getting artifacts when your image is rubbish. So you have to experiment. Don't just assume really no numbers. When I first started doing planet imaging, everything I read was talking about 5%, 10% max of the frames in Registax. When back when it, before auto stack it came out, and everything seemed to assume you're only going to stack a very low percentage of your frames, but it doesn't work for me anyway. High percentage is 25, even 30, 40 percent. If it's a good night and you've got a really nice video, 40 percent stacks will work superbly because you're then stacking 3,000 frames, uh, and that means that there's no noise at all. I mean, I've had Mars images where you could you just there's just no noise; they just look perfectly crisp. So. Yeah, definitely experiment with those percentages and go for, use maybe 25% as a baseline to start working backwards and forwards from and see how you get on. If you've got a night where the video is so bad that you just can't do anything, then you know, stack them just for the amusement value, but you're not going to get good images out. Seeing is one of those things you can't really do anything about. If it's dreadful, then it's dreadful. Um, and it's like being out of focus. In the end, rubbish coming out of the sky, you <laughs> have rubbish images. So. So that's, a, that's how I thought it was a kind of an interesting comparison because um, it was brought up because I've seen some stuff people have been posting where they've been clearly struggling a bit and gone for a low percentage. And I think they've got a better result in here just by just by upping the percentage on the stack. Um, you'll know once as soon as you get into Registax, you'll know if you've gone too far. The other trick we all know, I guess we've done a bit of Registax talk before, but the other trick in Registax is whatever, however you think you start blowing, you start increasing all the sliders in Registax and then get to where you think it should be and then dial it back a bit. Because <laughs> you always, when you're in Registax, you think it looks better than it does. And then you get the final image out, you save it, you post it up and you go, mm, it looks a bit, you know that over-processed look that we've all <laughs> achieved many times? To me, the, the real aim is to try not to look over-processed, to try and na be natural um, with everything about the image. Same with colours. You do a color balance, you register to do a nice job of color balancing mostly, um, but look at some reference images of Jupiter, go what color is it really? And what, if my images are purple <laughs> in places, it's probably not right. But you see images that are really pretty but don't look anything like the object in question. Because your camera does not give, give accurate color recognition. The three channels in your camera are not equally sensitive. Um, they should be in theory, but they're, they're not. So, yeah, you need to find out. And once you find out the kind of color balances that work for your camera, they're going to be pretty consistent. That it, the color balance doesn't change that much over time, I've found. Once you get used to your camera, you know exactly what's going to come out of it, and it tends to be consistent. Um, my old camera, I've done 90% of the images you might have seen from me, it was a QHY 5.2. That definitely had a red tint for everything that came off it. This camera seems to have a green tint for everything that comes off it. So. <laughs> Why that is that? Well, how are we doing? What time is it? Yeah, 10 minutes. All right, okay, that's pretty good then. Um, so, yeah, reach, then what else did I have there? Anything else there? Oh, I'm assuming we got a comment from the live stream that says changing the noise robust setting as well as using blur and experimental features will, from my experience, change the graph and software's perceived quality of the image. The noise blur. Noise, noise robust, it says. In what program? I'm assuming he means auto stack it. I've never even seen this. No, I mean, okay, there's a noise robust setting which we should definitely have a look at because I have no, I haven't tried that. So, 
So you all benefit from playing it. Once you've got to the point where you're taking these images, have a look through all the menus. It's amazing what's hiding away in there in advanced settings that is actually turns out to be the magic bullet for what you were trying to solve. Yeah, the, the, the thing that was discouraging me a while back was yeah. that uh, uh, with deep sky images, sometimes the color, I couldn't get the colors to yeah. be the same as what I would be on the records. Exactly. Because I was looking at them. That star, I know that star is supposed to be green, um, yeah. orange, and that one's supposed to be blue, but uh, so like, why are they both it's the, the same? It's probably, in some ways, the most challenging area of deep sky. So people have had a lot of time focusing on noise and but yeah. getting the actual getting color, that the problem is there isn't really a right answer, of course, because yeah. most very few deep sky images that you see are are true color in the sense of what you'd see. Mm -hmm. Most of the good ones are done using narrowband filters anyway, so it's a reconstructed mm -hmm. image where you've chosen to make hydrogen alpha look like this, and you've chosen to make oxygen yeah, look like this. So that's not real color. Mm -hmm. um, the Hubble palette, that classic thing you see all the time, that doesn't look anything like what the objects would really look like with an naked eye. Um, but it's a good representation of what information is in there. Um, so, that's a, so I had a few things that I think are quite useful. Um, planning. Planning your sessions for planetary imaging is frankly super important. Um, if you want to be out there taking an image of, an, of, of a transiting moon with a shadow, it really helps if you can find out when those are happening. <laughs> so I, mean, I use a site called uh, Project Pluto, Project Pluto J, I think, yeah, which is a, just simply a list. It's in UTC time, but it's easy enough to convert that to your own time. Um, but it literally says, at 10.32 p.m., a shadow transit will begin for Io on Jupiter. If you're out there with your telescope at 10.32 p.m., you will see that transit star. It's accurate enough that you can get you can get those bits where the shadow's crossing the side of the planet, all that stuff, and all those fancy images you want to get. You can find that time when there's two shadows on the moon, on the planet at the same time, or whatever. That's, that's a really, really super resource for planning in conjunction with your chosen um, Stellarium or whatever your chosen planetarium software is, which will tell you where the planets are in the sky at any given moment. The other one that's useful if you're planning, if you, if you want to go for trying to look for a particular image, you want the red spot and the shadow at the same time, you find one in Project Pluto or something similar that tells you where it's going to be, you can then go to Cal Sky. Cal Sky is the parent view, which is that just is one of them. Um, you die type, put in the exact time you're going to take the image, and you put in the um, your location. You then say render, and it will show you exactly what the planet's going to look like at that time, including shadows and planet moons and everything else. So you go, okay, if I take this image 20 minutes later, it's going to look better. <laughs> so you can plan when you want to be set up and taking images. I'll I'll post this on this spreadsheet up on the Facebook group. Um, that's a really great link. The cow sky is awesome. It's not the easiest to get used to. You can actually enter the details of your telescope and it will show you how big it's going to be and everything. It's, it's really quite nice. Um, telescope calculators. Lots of, you tend to, at some point you start wondering about focal lengths and magnifications and stuff. Uh, Astronomy.tools has a bunch of different online calculators where you can, you'll type in the, all the details about your telescope and you'll choose your camera and it'll tell you how many arc seconds of sky your pixel is going to be. Which does allow you to work things out sometimes in advance you want to. Or even if you've just taken a picture of Jupiter, you want to know how far away, how big was Jupiter, how far away is Jupiter. You can actually work all that out from your image because your image is a scientific image of Jupiter. It's, once you know the magnification of your telescope and how big the pixels are, you can see exactly how big a feature on Jupiter is. So you can actually work it out because you've got the right numbers from your image. You can go, when I took this image, the right red spot was you know, 5,000 kilometers or whatever, 10,000 kilometers across or something. You know, it's, uh, obviously that's a bit abstract, but there are times when it's really useful. So Astronomy Tools is definitely worth it. The other one that Astronomy Tools does, which is um, really good, is Field of View. This is also for your deep sky stuff. You go in there, you enter all the details of your telescope, all the details of your camera, you then tell it what it's going to be looking at, and it will show you how what's in the frame. So if you're thinking, I might take a picture of the Lagoon Nebula, It'll show you exactly how big the Lagoon Nebula is going to be in your images, so you can plan. Can you do it in one shot? Do you need to do a mosaic? Whatever. Do I need to use a field focal reducer if I want to get it? Same goes to show you how big Jupiter is going to be in your frame, so you get some idea in advance of what's going to happen. You know what you're looking for. So that's a useful tool. So yeah, I've got up a couple of useful tools there. Right, so I think we're pretty much out of time there, aren't we? <coughs> so hopefully. 
some of those things would be of some use. Uh, I was throwing together a little hurry later today, but uh, uh, now we're back in the stream of things. We'll be back in a month, and we'll, uh, I'm going to try and organise some speakers who have uh, got some expertise to offer, rather than my dabblings. And uh, uh, I'd, like us to, I'd like to be at some kind of uh, group sessions, hopefully with the telescope here. Mm. We'll talk to Bill yeah. about getting uh, a camera on the Zeiss and taking some planetary images, and hopefully we'll be able to do some of those. Once we get a little further on the year, and it's the planets are available earlier in the evening, at night, because at the moment it's still early hours in the morning, there are capturing planets. It's not like we can't come here early hours in the morning, because we can. It is, an, it is an observatory, so it's supposed to be used at night. <coughs> but we should definitely arrange some sessions. Once we get it working, we should definitely arrange some sessions, and people will be quite welcome to book in and book for a session and come along. And if, if you haven't got your own setup, it'd be really great to come in and actually take some images with the Zeiss. Yeah. And you know, give people opportunity to do stuff who haven't got a great home setup, or who just want to see what a big telescope is. I'm really, I'm really fascinated to see what the same camera on a that bloody great thing is going to do. You know, <laughs> um, now it's a go-to telescope. It's a bit more practical. And speaking of those, can we actually have them in the home for hire? There is a camera for hire. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, Talk to Darren, and he'll be able to. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, so there is a planetary camera for well, I, I can help from the uh, society man. available. One of these kind of units, not this one, but similar. Similar. A similar one, which is available to hire if you haven't got one and you want to try it. Um, so that'd be great. But yeah, the other thing we've got here, and we're definitely keen to get going again. I was talking with Bill and Grant about it a while ago. Is the solar scope? There's an, an amazing solar telescope attached to the Zeiss. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a better than anyone's got who's doing stuff at home apart from people who've got lots of money. Um, and it's never really been utilised um, since the Venus transit was bought for in 2012, I think. It's the last time it was really used seriously. We used it for Mercury as well later. Um, and it's a great piece of equipment. And with good cameras, the cameras are much better now. It would be really great to see what we can do with that. So that's another thing I'd like to maybe think about getting some sessions going, where we actually try and use the solar scope to capture. They're all the same principles apply to solar capture that apply to capture the moon, really, it's not really any difference. Um, obviously there's a lot of differences, but there's not fundamentally a difference from the capture and processing perspective, you're doing much the same thing. So anyway, all right guys, um, uh, anyone wants to go to the planetarium, there's a planetarium yeah. session just about starting, so I think you definitely probably want to do that some people. Thank you very much. Uh, not personally, it depends, it's completely dependent on what kind of telescope you've got, but uh, we can if you got if you're on the Facebook page, yeah. uh, post that on the Facebook page and we'll try and get people to give some recommendations because it, it completely depends on what kind of telescope you've got and what kind of budget you've got. <laughs> <laughs>